Today as we start, I want to do something a little different. Usually I tell you a nice little story to get us going, but what I want to do is read three Bible verses with you. And as I read those three Bible verses, I'm hoping that you will see something of your value and see something of the incredible value that was paid for your redemption. So the first Bible verse I want to share with you is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, where it says, For you have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. The second verse I want to share with you is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 15. And it says here that Jesus died for all, that we who live should no longer live for themselves, for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. The final verse I want to share with you is found in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18 and 19, where the question is asked, Do you not know that you were redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life, inherited from your forefathers? Instead, you were purchased with with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless the blood of Christ in these three verses we see two things we see the value of every human being we see your value and my value by the incredible price that was paid for our redemption that price is none other than the infinite gift of the life of Jesus the second thing that we see in here is that because we have been bought with that incredible price and because that defines our value, we are called to a high purpose or a high calling. When you understand your value, when you understand what was paid for your redemption, that creates within your heart a desire to honor the value that was placed upon you. It creates within you a desire to honor the one who has paid such an incredible price for you. Now, while we're on the note of talking about value, here's a little interesting historical fact for you. In the year 2011, a, a, a young guy by the name of Eric Finman, he was 12 at the time, took $1,000 and bought, bought a bunch of Bitcoin. Now, if you don't know what Bitcoin is, it's what they call cryptocurrency. It's sort of like a digital version of genuine currency. Well, when this, first thing, when this thing first came on the market, a lot of people looked at it with skepticism. And yet over time, it's proved itself to be here for the long haul. So this 12-year-old child took a chance. He bought $1,000 worth of Bitcoin, and today he's worth some $4.5 million. Time and money are the two commodities of this life that are in short supply. Time is the measure of life. Money is the measure of earthly wealth. Jesus told a parable, and it's found in the book of Matthew, chapter 25. And in this parable, in Matthew 25, Jesus uses the language of, of talents to talk about how each and every human being has been given gifts by the Heavenly Father. These gifts are gifts of character. They are also gifts of abilities. And he uses this to describe, in the context of Matthew 24, to describe in the shortness of time before the Lord Jesus returns, how we should use the time that's been apportioned to us. So in Matthew 24, and we've actually looked at some, at some parables in the vicinity of Matthew 24. We've looked, for instance, at the, the parable where Jesus talks about a fig tree that buds, right? And you can tell the change of season by looking at the fig tree that buds. And he says, therefore, in a similar way, there are signs in the world that tell you that this age of sin, this age of salvation is coming to an end. And the glorious kingdom of Jesus Christ is about to make its full and final establishment for all time and for all eternity. He, he talks about the urgency of the times and the necessity of us being prepared. And then in Matthew 25, he goes on, tying in with the urgency, to talk about the time we have left, the time of our earthly lives, and what does it mean if you do align yourself with the heavenly king, with the heavenly kingdom, if you become a citizen of that heavenly kingdom to come, what would you be doing as a citizen of the kingdom awaiting the arrival of the kingdom? Do we kick back, put our feet up, and as it were, relax until the return of Jesus? Having received Jesus, do we sort of sit back and go, whew, thank God I'm saved. I'm just going to chill out now and wait it out until the Lord returns? Well, Jesus has a different take on it. His take, in essence, if I were to summarize it, is that if you have been saved for the eternal kingdom, then that means you have been saved for service down here until the arrival of the future kingdom. 
Now you think, wait a second, wait a second, how does that work? Well, think about this. Think about this. In essence, what sin is, the brokenness of this world caused by sin, the result of death that is the consequence of sin. When you think about what sin is at its core, when you go back to the original transgression of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, sin at its core is putting me, myself, and I, the unholy, selfish trinity, ahead of everything and anyone else. The dream that Adam and Eve are sold that causes them to transgress the commandment of God in the Garden of Eden, plunging them and this world into the experience of sin with all its uh, sad consequences. The, the thing that they are sold, the dream, is the dream of selfish pursuit. You will be like God. You can be like Him. You don't need to live under the dominion or under accountability to anyone else. You don't need to live in, with regard to the way you, your life and your choices affect anybody else. Do you. Do you in your own way and forget about anyone and everybody else. The dream that Satan sells Adam and Eve is the dream of selfish pursuit, selfish ambition. You will ascend, you will be like, you can take the place of, you can be the top dog in the show, right? You don't need to settle for being second. It was the very reason that Lucifer left his incredible place of trust and pursued that same dream. He sells it to humanity. And ever since then, the thing we have struggled with, the thing that every human being has plagued with, is the struggle against self. Because we want what we want, we want it when we want it, and we want it without regard to the happiness or the, or the well-being of anybody else, right? To some greater or lesser degree, that manifests in every single one of us from the day we are born where we're squabbling with our sibling over whose toys are whose in the lounge to one day when we are a corporate CEO or trying to be a corporate CEO. It's this, it's the struggle of selfishness. That is at its core what sin is. Now think about this. If you and I are saved for all eternity, then what are we saved from? We know that we're saved for eternal life because the result of sin is that we die, right? We want to escape death, so we want eternal life. Okay, that's fine. But, but, Apart from the results, sin equals death, salvation in Jesus Christ equals eternal life, what is it at its core to be saved? It's not simply reaping the benefit of eternal life. Being saved at its core is this idea that if my problem is that I am selfish, if my problem is that I am sold into self-service, then to be saved isn't merely to have the consequence of eternal life. To be saved is to be liberated from selfishness, to be liberated from selfish pursuit. So if I am truly saved, it's not only the claim of having eternal life through the blessing of Jesus Christ. If I am truly saved, the truest measure of my salvation is that I am no longer living for self. So get this, the offer of eternal life can be deceptive because there are plenty of selfish people who would want eternal life. There are plenty of people who will accept Jesus Christ and his offer of eternal life out of their own self-interest. Which is why the, the Bible is full of this idea that not everybody who says they are saved is truly saved. What's the hallmark? What's the quintessential evidence that someone is saved? It's not their claim to have Jesus Christ because many people will claim to have Jesus Christ. It's their character. It's the way that they choose to live their lives that is the demonstration of their claim to be saved. And what does that life look like? Well, if sin is at its core selfishness, and that's what was sold to humankind, then to be saved is that we have so lost ourselves in Jesus Christ in love for Him and His character that we are emulating His life in this world. We are now pursuing heaven's agenda. We are now living the life of unselfish service. And we're not living that life to be saved. We're living that life because we've come to the place where in surrender to Jesus, we realize we no longer need to fight for ourselves. We no longer need to defend ourselves. When you begin to understand 
that you no longer need to establish your own righteousness, establish your own security, establish your own life. Establish. It's all been done in Jesus. You are free from having to save yourself. For the first time in your life, you realize that you are truly free to live unselfishly. If he has taken care of me, then I no longer need to worry about me and I'm now free to take care of you. So coming back to those three verses we first read, right? Those three verses that said that we have been purchased with this incredible gift. We are of an inestimable value judged by the, by the value of the payment for our lives. When we realize that because of that, we are in a sense under a joyful obligation to live unselfishly for the one who gave himself unselfishly for us, we realize the value of what Jesus is telling us here in Matthew chapter 25, where he tells the story of the talents. He invites us to step in to the life of unselfish service while we're awaiting the return of Jesus, while we're awaiting the once uh, the, the, the future destination of living in the kingdom of God without the presence of sin, free of the environment of sin, delivered from this body of sin, no more struggling against this nature of sin. That future reality is coming, but what does it look like now if we are truly citizens of that kingdom, if we are truly uh, delivered from ourselves, then we will live as is described here in the story in Matthew 25. Now I'm going to summarize it for you. And it goes like this. A man comes to his servants. He says, I'm going away on a long journey. I'm going to give to each of you a trust. I'm going to give to each of you what is called here talents. So this is verse 14 of Matthew 25. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. Now those possessions are measured by talents. Talent in the Bible language is a measure of weight. And often a talent was used to measure out silver. So you could say that this is a financial analogy, right? The, the master comes and he gives, his, he gives his possessions, he gives his finances into trust to his servants. He's going on a faraway journey. The man in this parable is Jesus. Jesus here is nearing the end of his ministry. He's prefiguring the fact that he will, after his death and after his resurrection, he will return to heaven to continue his heavenly ministry in our behalf. And when he does that, what will be entrusted to us are the character, the fruits of the Spirit, and the abilities, the gifts of the Spirit. Because after Jesus ascended and went to heaven, to that faraway land, his church, the early apostles and the early believers, were blessed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. And along with the gift and the presence of the Holy Spirit came these special abilities, came this ripening of character. So we're talking about two things here, both character and ability. Jesus here is prefiguring the fact that he will return to heaven and he will entrust his servants with this incredible wealth of heaven that we may trade with it and thus bring others into the family of God in preparation for the final arrival of the kingdom. So as it goes, one man is entrusted with five, another man is entrusted with two, another man is entrusted with one. Each is given abilities, each is given according to what the master looks and realizes they're capable of handling. Not everyone gets the same. Not everyone gets the same number. Not everyone gets the same value, as it were. Not everyone gets the same uh, particular gifts and abilities. But all are entrusted with a measure for the sake of the kingdom of God. And they are now to go out and honor the master by trading with them and coming back with still more. I mean, hey, the goal of your Bitcoin investment or the goal of your fiat currency investment, the goal of your daily labor for your boss on earth is always to gain an increase. So too in the kingdom of heaven. This analogy is used to describe this idea that when we are saved, we are saved for service. This, this is the quintessential evidence that we are truly saved. We are called out of ourselves. We don't just kick back, put our feet up and say, thank God he's given me eternal life. I'm just going to wait here until that day comes. No, we are freed from our selfish pursuit, our love of ease, our, our living for ourselves and our vacations and our, and our wonderful adventures and all the rest. We're actually saved from our selfish pursuits. 
that we may go out and labor in his behalf. We may go out and work for his kingdom, that his kingdom may grow and expand, that more of his of those for whom he has died, who are his both by creation and redemption, will become aware of his incredible love, his, his magnificent character, who will be drawn to him and be ready for his soon return. You see, I'm going to say this one more time because it's worth emphasizing. The evidence that we are of the kingdom, that we are saved, is not simply that we claim Jesus Christ, quote Bible verses, and know all the right things to say. It is seen in the act of character of service. Character that employs abilities for the service of God. Character of self unselfishness and the abilities of service. Whatever He has bestowed to us, our time, our influence, our words, our health, and whatever else you have at your disposal. Some people have one thing in greater measure than others but all used for the kingdom of God, not least of which is even our financial resources. Hey, the parable itself is about financial resources. It applies to so much more than financial resources, but it also suggests to us that even the coins in our wallet, whether it is virtual cryptocurrency or genuine, you know, tangible currency, whatever we have by way of earthly wealth, is a spiritual gift. Whatever we give back to God that He has first given to us is a gift from Him to us, returned to Him for a spiritual purpose. It becomes a spiritual gift. There are even evidences in Scripture where God actually bestows upon us abilities that we didn't have before. I mean, you read Ephesians chapter 4, you read 1 Corinthians chapter 12. These are spiritual gift passages. They include things like preaching and teaching and prophecy and gifts of healings and tongues and all sorts of things that, that sometimes God says to us, you don't have this ability, but if you step out in faith in my service, if you step out and walk forward and hear my calling, forget about yourself and your own personal ambitions for this world, and you step forward in selfish, disinterested service, if you step forward in unselfish, disinterested service for others, right? Then I will give you what you lack right now. It's a little bit like the children of Israel. When they finally finished their 40 years of wandering in the desert and God said, I want you to go in and possess the promised land. They had an obstacle between them and the promised land. It was the mighty, wide, flowing river Jordan. Now, just like 40 years before, where God opened the Red Sea so that they could escape from the armies of Egypt, right? So too now, God says to them, I need you to cross this body of water that you may go into the promised land. But you know what? The first time, the 40 years before, when they were small in faith, small in spiritual experience, God said to them, stand here and watch what I'm going to do. And he parted the water and then they walked through. The second time, he says to them, walk. You've seen that first experience. You've had 40 years with me in the wilderness. This time I'm going to ask a little more of you. I'm going to ask you to walk. And it was only as the priests put their feet in the river Jordan that then it parted and opened up and they walked through. So too you and I, when we follow God in faith, when we don't look at our circumstances and our lack of abilities and what we don't have and go, Lord, I can't do this thing because I don't have this. I, 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 I'll never be like you in character. I'm not like you that. I'm not like that now. Or I can't do this work for you, however great or small, because that's not me. I don't have those abilities. When we're looking at our circumstances, when we're looking at our own lack, we see a bigger problem and a smaller God. When you realize who God is, when you realize the price that He's paid, when you realize that all His commands are His enablings, He does not ask you to do something that He will not provide the resource, the ability, the character to accomplish. When you realize that, when you comprehend that, and then you step out in faith into this unknown, His promise is, I will provide for you everything that you need. In fact, the story, this parable, begins first with the fact that, the, that the, the owner entrusts what is his to 
his servants. He doesn't say, go out there with nothing and make something out of nothing. He first gives them and then they go out in faith and trust for what he has first given them and it is multiplied. You and I, we have infinite scope for growth if we will simply go forward in faith, listen to what he commands and believe that his commands are enablings. You see, you and I are called to the life of unselfish service. We are called to employ our talents. They may be our abilities, our musical abilities, our oratory abilities, our powers of mind. They may be our, our financial wealth, a spirit of generosity. It may be our time. It may be, uh, it may be our words. Whatever it is that is yours today, if you will give it to God in faith, use it for the growth of his kingdom, use it to honor him. If you will persist in pushing forward into the dark unknown because you know who he is, you know that he never lets you down and you know this promise that he will come through for you, you will find everything you entrust to his service, whether it is your character or whether it is your abilities or whether it is your possessions, you will find that he multiplies it for his purpose, for his glory, and for the salvation of others. Perhaps you're seeing a high and holy calling of character. You realize you are not like that. You realize you are deficient in a thousand different ways, but you know that you, you, you see something in this Jesus Christ. You want what he's offering. That very desire in your heart is the work of the Holy Spirit. Because you and I do not naturally, apart from His work in our lives, we do not naturally want the kingdom of God. Our default bias, our default tendency is to worldliness. It's to the, to the kingdoms of this world, to the tangible, what we can see, what we can touch, what we can handle, what we can smell, what we can taste, what we can feel. That is the default of human nature. By default, we have a tendency towards sinful pleasure. That is what comes to us naturally. So if you have seen something in Jesus Christ, if you have a desire for something better, if you, if you, if you feel called into the field of mission and service, I want to tell you right now, you ask for evidence of God, that is the very evidence of God. That is the very evidence that, that some, there's something else in this world that's calling you out of the natural flow, calling you to swim upstream. People say, where is the evidence of God? <laughs> in a world like ours, for beings with a sinful human nature, selfish to our core, selfish to our core, anytime you hear that voice, every time you sense that calling, every time you see something wonderful in the character of Jesus, or you have a desire for the kingdom of God, that is the evidence of God working in your life, calling to you because it goes against everything that you naturally are. So where does it come from if not within you? It comes because God is the other side of the coin in this world. He is the one who is calling us to his kingdom. So yield to that voice, take that risk, step out in faith, put your feet in the river Jordan, invest in the kingdom of God, invest in the kingdom of God, invest in the kingdom of God, because in the end, it is the only thing that will last. This world is telling you invest down here. This world is telling you spend your time, your energy, your talents, your health, your wealth to build your earthly castle down here. And the kingdom of God is saying, hey, there's something more beyond. If you invest only in this world, if you surrender only to this world's way, you are investing in something that is about to collapse. There was a time when all there was was fiat currencies, the gold standard. And suddenly somebody came along and invented a cryptocurrency. 18,000 people saw something that others didn't see. They invested, they translated their fiat currency, their, their money, right? into cryptocurrency and now they're millionaires. Don't miss out on the kingdom wave. Don't miss out because you're too short-sighted that you can only see this world and its promises and its aspirations. Invest, invest, invest 
in the kingdom of God. Surrender your heart and your life to Jesus Christ. He paid for you that you might give all that you are, all that you have, as feeble and defective as that is, back to Him. He is the first great investor and you are simply investing in response to His first investment in you. The beauty of the kingdom of God is that the one who's calling you to invest everything you have has put his money where his mouth is, has put his blood on the line, right? He has laid down his life to invest in you, to redeem you, and he's simply now asking you to respond in kind. He has given all, and he asks you to give in all. That's those first three texts we read at the beginning. We have been bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. And if we have been so bought by the precious blood of Christ, what does that mean for the obligation, for the calling upon our lives? It means something very clear about how God sees us and how valuable we are to Him. Now, do we see the same in Him? Do we see in Him the pearl of great price, the, the treasure hidden in a field? Do we see in Him the, the prize above all prizes? Will we give Him every ability, every bit of our resources? Will we surrender to Him the defects of our character and trust in Jesus Christ for our redemption? See, when you exercise your will, your power of choice to combine with God's will, then your will becomes omnipotent. Have you ever thought about that? When you unite your feeble and defective will with His perfect and all-powerful will, your will becomes omnipotent. All the resources of heaven are at your disposal. He will perfect in you His glorious character. He will raise you up from wherever you are, broken with all your bad behaviors, all your bad habits, all your tendencies cultivated and inherited, those tendencies of a lifetime. He will resurrect you to newness of life. He will make you a new creature, according to 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. He will reproduce Himself in you. And then as you experience that day by day, you will go with Him and for Him in willing service. You will be liberated from your selfish ambitions and the, and the life of, of Jesus Christ will be manifested in you who left His comfort zone. He didn't just recline with His feet up, but He left that there to enter upon a life of hard service, of toil, of rejection. A life that wasn't always appreciated by the very ones He came to seek and to save and to serve. He calls us to go and put our feet in His footsteps. And this is what it means to be saved. To be saved isn't merely to have the promise of eternal life. It means to become a new creature. To be saved isn't just lip service. Oh, I love you, Jesus. To be saved is to be living the life of Christ. And no, I don't mean that you will live without sin. I mean that you will live a life of repentance. What does that mean? It means that you have seen something better. You are now reoriented towards that something better, who is Jesus Christ. You are now living for that something better. You are striving for that something better. No more excuses, no more lowering the standard. The, the high and holy standard of the law of God is that standard. And there is no excuse for any one of us, no matter what our circumstances, what our backgrounds, where we come from, there is no excuse for not meeting that standard. We do not lessen the the standard to be saved we recognize that standard and then we move towards it and even as we move towards it we stumble and we fall and we do not measure up for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God but in order in order to see the kingdom of God fulfilled in us we do not lower the standard to meet us we keep it up there and we turn to Jesus Christ in repentance we turn to Jesus with confession of sin and in that confession, He covers us in His righteousness. Day by day, we are becoming more like Him, never quite reaching the fullness of who He is, but living with security, knowing that as we head towards that ultimate goal, even now our security is that He covers us with all of the perfection of His character. So we are free no longer to obsess about ourselves and our security. We trust in what He has done and what He is doing in us. And now we live the life of service towards others. We reach out the way He reached out. We leave our comfort zone like He left His comfort zone. 
We lay down our life in willing, humble service for others. Whatever that might look like in your particular case, with your particular spiritual gifting, with the special way in which he calls and equips you, whatever that might look like, you live no longer for yourself, but for others. This is what Jesus says, the true citizens of the kingdom, as they await the final manifestation of the kingdom, will be spending their time on earth doing. This is how you know the true citizens of heaven. Not merely those who claim salvation, who claim forgiveness, who do lip service, who quote all the right things and do all the right external religious uh, aspects, but rather live the true life of service. So that as we do that, our talents are multiplied. The kingdom is glorified and expanded. And Jesus' most sober warning at the end of this parable is for that one, for that, for that steward who he gave only one talent to. Each of them doubled it, right? The one who had five came back with ten. The one who had two came back with four. But then there was the one. Verse 24 says, And the one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid, and I went away, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. Verse 26, But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow, and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him, and give it to the one who has the ten talents." The most sober part of the story is what Jesus says at the end here. He identifies that the man that did not do anything with his talent did not step forward in faith, did not realize that if the master has given this gift, the master will accomplish also its enlargement. Instead, he sat on it. He did nothing with it. He lived the selfish life. He chose the path of self-preservation. He did the minimum he could do in an effort, well, to simply save himself. And in the end, the master says, that's not the life of the faithful servant. So I implore you, I implore you, trust yourself to Jesus Christ. See what others do not see in the kingdom of God. Invest, 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 because it is the one investment that cannot and will not fail. It's the one investment ultimately that, although it feels like a risk, is not a risk at all. And we know that because that kingdom has already been capitalized by the first great investment that Jesus Christ himself made. God has already guaranteed its success. He has already hedged it with his own currency, with his love, his grace, and his sacrifice. And now he calls you and me to invest in a sure fire thing. So will you take that risk? Will you step out in faith? Will you invite the fulfillment of the kingdom of God in your life and in your character? And will you then serve that kingdom of God with your talents, your abilities, your time, your influence, your words, your everything that you are. As he gave all, you give all. Let me pray with you. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd put the spirit of willing service in our hearts. I pray that you would break this infatuation with self that is the greatest curse of the human experience and the greatest curse that we struggle with day by day. I pray, Lord, that you'd put this this faith, this vision, this love for you in our hearts that will make us a new creation and a new creature for the sake and the glory of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' name, amen.